Hi you guys! This is my last accounting video and today we're covering chapter 17. It's important to note that you do not need to know all the ratios in this chapter because there are a lot of them. You only need to know the ones that I go over in this video. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I hope these videos were helpful and best of luck on the final. Let's get started. Chapter 17 is Financial Statement Analysis. The objective of accounting is to provide relevant and timely information to support the decision-making needs of financial statement users, and that is the definition we used all the way back in Chapter 1, so taking it full circle now, bankers, creditors, and investors all rely on financial statements to provide insight into a company's financial condition and performance. And they typically evaluate this in terms of liquidity, solvency, and profitability. So those are the three, um, three key terms we're going to be working with and categorizing things with uh, throughout chapter 17. Okay, so liquidity is a company's ab ability to convert assets into cash. And who is concerned with this? That would be short-term creditors like banks. And they're concerned with whether a company will be able to repay its short-term borrowings like loans and notes. So they want to know what assets you have and how quickly they can be converted into cash so they can evaluate how quickly it would take um, to get their money back if there was a problem. Solvency is a company's ability to make both its periodic interest payments and repay the face value of debt at maturity. So long-term creditors that loan money for long periods of time are concerned with solvency, and this is typically bondholders. So if they um, do a 10-year bond, a 20-year bond, uh, anything like that, they want to know that they're going to be getting their interest payments that were arranged for each year and to make sure they're going to get the face value of debt at maturity. And then profitability is a company's ability to generate earnings and this is one you're probably familiar with. So investors uh, such as stockholders are concerned with profitability because they benefit from increases in the price of a company's shares and because of this, they want to evaluate the potential for the company's uh, stock price to continue to increase. And the price of a company's stock obviously depends on a variety of factors, one of which is just like consumer sentiment and all sorts of stuff like that. But it depends a lot on a company's current and future earnings. So that is where profitability comes uh, into play. Okay, now that we know those, we're going to look at some basic analytical methods, the first of which is horizontal analysis. Horizontal analysis is the analysis of increases and decreases in both the amount and percentage of comparative financial statement items. So that means you're looking at the same item over time. So maybe you're looking at the increase in revenue from 2019 to 2020, the increase in um, current assets from 2019 to 2020, or something like that. So each item on the most recent statement is compared with the same item on one or more earlier statements in terms of the following. The first is the amount of increase or decrease, so that is the dollar value. And then we look at the percent increase or decrease, because <clears throat> sometimes that's the better comparative metric. And when you're comparing, the earlier statement is used as the base year. And I'll show you that on the next slide. Okay, so in this example, I don't remember which company this was, but clearly it was a little while ago when I first made these slides because the most recent year is 2017. But if we were going to do horizontal analysis um, of let's do total revenue, it would go as follows. First, we're going to look at the dollar amount increase year over year from 2016 to 2017. So how we do that is we take the value in 2017, which was $7,301,505, and subtract the value in 2016, which was 
$1,430, and that gets us an increase of $1,447,075 year over year from 2016 to 2017. And then for the percentage increase year over year, um, you might be familiar with this formula, but I'll write it just in case you're not, but percent change is equal to the value in this year, so this will be year subscript 1 minus the value in the previous year, so year 0 divided by the value in the previous year. So in this case, what that would look like would be um, the value of revenue in 2017, so that's 7 million, minus the value in 2016, that 5 million, divided by the value in 2016, that 5 million again. And if we do out that calculation, we get the percent increase in revenue year over year is 24.72%. So from 2016 to 2017, revenue increased by 24.72%. And then we could do it from 2015 to 2016 and compare that, or from 2014 to 2015 and compare that. So see um, by what percent change revenue has been increasing over time. We can also look at the cost of revenue. Um, using horizontal analysis so we can see how much revenue increased from period to period, but then compare it to how much the cost of revenue increased from period to period. Um, you can look at the change in net income, so horizontal analysis is a really valuable tool. Okay, vertical analysis. So vertical analysis is the percentage analysis of the relationship of each component in a financial statement to the total in the statement. So before we were looking at just one line item, now we're looking at each component uh, compared to the total. So in vertical analysis of the balance sheet, the percentages are computed as follows. Each asset item is stated as a percent of total assets, which is normal and what you'd expect. But each liability and stockholders' equity item is stated as a percentage of the total liabilities and stockholders' equity. So it's not liabilities as a percent of uh, total liabilities, it's liabilities as a percentage of total liabilities and stockholders' equity combined. So that's a little different, so just make sure you're aware of that. And then in vertical analysis of the income statement, each item is stated as a percentage of sales, and that's where you get different margins from. So um, vertical analysis of... Uh, gross profit. Gross profit as a percent of sales is known as your gross margin. So we'll get into that in a second, but just make sure you know uh, the little distinction for the balance sheet. Okay, so in this example, we now have a balance sheet on the right. Again, I don't remember which company it was, but uh, if we were doing vertical analysis now of current assets and more specifically cash and cash equivalents, we would do the following. So if we're looking at cash and cash equivalents in 2017, that is this value right here, the $2,306,072. And using vertical analysis, now we're not looking at the previous period or anything, we're only looking within 2017, and we're looking at cash and cash equivalents as a percentage of total assets. So that's this number down here, 14535556 so all you would do would be divide cash and cash equivalents divided by total assets, and that tells you that um, cash and cash equivalents as a percentage of total assets is 15.87%. And then you could calculate this for 2016, 2015, and 2014, and then compare how the percentage of uh, cash and cash equivalents uh, as a percentage of total assets changes over time. So is it getting higher? Is it getting lower? Um, and stuff like that. So also a valuable tool for analysis. And then a common size statement, this usually comes up in multiple choice, so I would just um, know what it is. A common size statement is a statement in which all items are expressed as percentages. So there are no dollar amounts, and this makes it really useful for comparing one company with another or comparing a company with industry averages because you can't really use dollar amounts when you're comparing because it depends on the size of the company uh, and everything else, but percentages uh, help. So 
A common size statement is just a statement with all percentages, useful for comparisons. Okay, so now we're going to go into the ratios. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you don't need to know every single ratio in the chapter because there are a lot of them. Um, I'm going to go over the ones that you should know and that you'll most likely be tested on. And they are broken up into liquidity, solvency, and profitability. So starting with liquidity, we have the current ratio. And the current ratio is equal to current assets divided by current liabilities. And what is the current ratio useful for? It is a reliable indicator of a company's ability to pay its current liabilities. So obviously if it's one, if it's equal to one, that means current assets equal current liabilities. If it's less than one, it means current assets are less than current liabilities. And if it's greater than one, it means current assets are greater than current liabilities. So a higher number means you're in a better position to obtain short-term credit because you have a lot of current assets and you can easily pay off your current liabilities. So um, that makes it more likely for you to obtain it. Next, we have accounts receivable turnover. So accounts receivable turnover is equal to sales divided by average accounts receivable, with average accounts receivable um, being the average over uh, the past two years or whatever time period you're looking at. And here, again, a higher number is better. But it's important to remember that all of this is relative. What's high for one company in one industry might not be considered high for a different company in a different industry um, and all sorts of stuff like that. You always have to look into the underlying reasons for, um, for the ratio. So why is accounts receivable turnover so high? Why is it so low? Why is current ratio high? Why is current ratio low? And stuff like that. So Frank always says it, but the ratios are relative and it depends. Sorry, a little side note, but for accounts receivable turnover, a higher number is generally better because that means the collection of receivables um, is improving as accounts receivable turnover increases. So here we're concerned about the collection of receivables. That's what we're concerned with, and higher means you're collecting them more efficiently. Okay, continuing on, number of days, sales, and receivables kind of a lot to say. It's also called receivable days. Um, it depends on where you're working, what you're doing, stuff like that, uh, what it's called. But number of days, sales, and receivables is what the book calls it, so that's what we're going to go with. And this is equal to average accounts receivable divided by average daily sales, where average daily sales is just sales divided by 365 days. The number of days, sales, and receivables is an estimate of the time in days that accounts receivable have been outstanding. So, in this case, what you would do is you would compare it with the credit term. So, if you remember back, when we have credit terms like N slash 30, that means net 30 days, that's what you're supposed to pay, um, pay it back in. So, if your credit terms are N slash 30, that means... The, they, should be, but they should have been paid back in 30 days, but say your number of days sales and receivables is 35, then that means it's taking you 35 days to collect those receivables. They should have been collected in 30 days, so maybe you need to be harsher with your collection procedures. Um, so here again, we're looking at efficiency at collecting receivables. Inventory turnover um, similar type formula to accounts receivable turnover, but we use cost of goods sold and inventory instead of sales and accounts receivable. So inventory turnover is equal to cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. And in this case, a higher number means better management of inventory. But again, it's always relative, but generally higher number means you are um, doing a better job. Number of days sales in inventory, also called inventory days, is equal to average inventory divided by average daily COGS. So that would be cost of goods sold divided by 365. 
And what this is, is it's an approximate measure of the time and days it takes to purchase, sell, and replace inventory. So in this case, a lower number is better because it means uh, this is happening faster. So again, all of these metrics are basically looking at the company's efficiency. So this would be the company's efficiency in managing its inventory. So that covers the liquidity ratios. Now moving on to solvency. What we have for solvency is the ratio of liabilities to stockholders' equity. Also called debt to equity, I would call it debt to equity. Um, totally up to you though, that's what the book calls it. So debt to equity is equal to total liabilities divided by total stockholders' equity. And what it does is it measures how much of the company is financed by debt and how much by equity. So it's interpretation, a lower ratio would mean it's financed less by debt. Pretty simple here, but um, a pretty valuable tool for evaluating solvency. And you'll see it a lot in practice. And then we have free cash flow, which you know from chapter 16, but just to go over it again. Free cash flow is equal to cash flows from operating activities minus cash used to purchase property, plant, and equipment. And if you remember, a company that has free cash flow is able to fund growth and acquisitions, retire debt, purchase treasury stock, and pay dividends. So the key here is if you have a lot of free cash flow, you have financial flexibility. And a company with no free cash flow may have limited financial flexibility, potentially leading to liquidity problems um, or even solvency problems down the road. Okay, moving on to profitability. A really common metric that I'm sure you'll see is earnings per share. And earnings per share is calculated as net income divided by preferred dividend, net income minus preferred dividends divided by the shares of common stock outstanding. So, earnings per share, again, you might have heard of it, measures the share of profits that are earned by a share of common stock. And that is why we are subtracting preferred dividends, because that is not attributed to the common stockholders. Earnings per share must be reported on the income statement. You'll usually see it down below net income. Really important metric, and we often look at earnings per share growth over time. And price to earnings. So this is known as the P-E ratio. The P-E ratio is equal to price per share divided by earnings per share. And that's price per share as in uh, what's the most recent price on the stock market. The P-E ratio on a common stock measures a company's future earnings prospects. And it tells how much you are willing to pay for $1 of a company's earnings. So if it was a PE of 20, that means the company's stock is selling at 20 times earnings per share. And PE can be evaluated, uh, interpreted differently. There are two main ways to look at it. So if a company has a really high PE ratio, it could be that it's extremely overvalued. So if it's 20 times, 30 times, 40 times earnings per share, you're paying a lot of money um, for $1 of a company's earnings. So maybe it's overvalued. Maybe that's way too much money. Or you could look at it as uh, investors see a lot of potential for this stock. That's why they're willing to pay so much money because they see um, growth opportunities in the future, which means earnings per share would increase in the future and that would bring the P-E ratio back down. So it could mean it's overvalued, but it could also mean investors see um, a lot of growth potential. Generally, if the P-E increases, it means the market expects the company to experience favorable earnings in the future. Um, and then same applies for a low P ratio. Maybe it's undervalued, maybe it's a bargain, or maybe it means investors don't think there's any growth prospects. So again, as always, it's relative and it depends. So this is all I have for you for chapter 17. I didn't feel like it was really necessary to do practice problems because it would just be calculating um, these ratios. But if you have any problems, as always, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for listening to all of these videos. And for the last time, I hope you have a great rest of your day.